So while, while we're waiting for the slide to come up, um, Sally is correct. Um, add to the three businesses, six children and nine grandchildren. Um, we're pretty, pretty busy about what we do. But love every minute of it, and um, that's what life's all about. It's about passion. So uh, we run a self-replacing merino enterprise on Warrendale. Warrendale's located out the Midwestern Highway. We're not in the Western Division. Um, we're located on the Midwestern Highway, about 45, 40, 45 kilometres out. Uh, we have about 20,000 acres, and um, we stock our stocking rates uh, one sheep to every four acres. But uh, as I said, like we, um, Ian's family um, has been grazing in the Hay area for over 150 years. So Ian, my husband over there in his lovely black and red Toyota, uh, is fifth generation grazier in the area, and Tom. Um, our son over there, and his five sisters are all sixth generation. So all six of our children um, have actually have input into our work, and we run everything as a family business. So as you can see, uh, we've tried a few things over the years, and that's probably my fault, um, much to Ian's disgust at times, but um, I really enjoy what I do. Um, so in, before EID was readily available to commercial producers, uh, we used Bioclip for a number of years, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with Bioclip. Um, it, the 80-20 rule uh, is completely reversed, so you get 20% gain for 80% effort. But it was a way of reducing um, the wrinkle in our sheep at the time. Uh, there's no better way to class a sheep than uh, with virtually no wool on it, so Bioclip and we use the retention nets, as you can see up there in the top left-hand corner. Um, and we were able to record uh, the flatter skins, but we're also able to record which sheep had medullation in them. Uh, and as primarily wool growers, medullation is not something that we particularly want in our sheep. Um, and we were also re recorded um, fleece weights, which was a very good way of doing it at the time and all recorded in spreadsheets. So I have got multiple spreadsheets on my computer at home. Um, and we were able to sort of choose what we wanted and what we didn't want, which sheep um, suited our wool enterprise. And those that didn't have the fleece weights or the micron data that we wanted, we would take down to Birrawa, which is a property that we have on the river and join to a white Suffolk. So they didn't fit into our wool enterprise, but they, they were still good sheep, so they fitted into our other enterprise. So we've been using EID, um, as you can see by my favourite picture there in the middle of Wanda, as they call her. Um, she, she, we use two tags. We use our NLIS tag on all our sheep, but we only use our EID on our ewes. So no weathers get EID tags, so therefore we use the two. And with the EID, we've been recording all their wool data, wool information, fleece weights, preg status, and now body weights of each individual animal in our flock. We've been non-mules since 2019, and it was a decision that was made after I'd been on a trip to England. Um, and I was talking to the Professor of Animal Management at Bristol University, and, and he sort of said to me, well, why don't you just try a couple? And it wasn't a very good lambing year, so we thought, well, we may as well try the lot. We're learning along the way. Uh, it is certainly um, in extensive, extensive rangelands areas. Um, Non-mulesing throws up so many challenges. Um, we're not as, um, we don't have as large an area as, as Bill, um, but to still get around the sheep, have a look, um, and do all that sort of thing is really quite challenging. And um, what I found this year in particular, because we were late coming into shearing, so we're about a month late due to COVID and due to the um, shearer shortages and things like that. So we were about a month late coming in to shear the weaners. So every day or every second day, Tom and I would be on motorbikes checking them. And what I found, and this is my observation, I'm not a scientist by any means, it's just an observation that I made along the way, was that 
DAG score has a really high impact on whether or not your sheep um, get struck with fly. So we could have um, skin wrinkle or breech wrinkle scores of three and those sheep are still running in the paddock completely on their own, have not touched them since, um, since they were shorn in the November, but there was a proportion of them, probably about 20% of them, that actually had a massive fly strike issue and Trent got an awful lot of maggots sent to him this year from us because <laughs> we've been um, in Trent's trial now for the last three years. But what I found was it didn't matter what your brody wrinkle was, it was the DAG score that was the massive issue. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm not scientific, but that was just an observation I made on a motorbike. Uh, some of them were you know, wrinkle score one. They were as flat skinned as they come, but because they had a high DAG score, then we found that they were uh, attracted by flies. Um, so what we did there was we decided, uh, I'm not too sure what the heritability of DAG strike is, um, but we felt that we didn't want to breed from these sheep. So they were sold um, a couple of months later after they'd healed and been shorn, and, um, but we just decided that they weren't worth breeding from, uh, take that risk out. So the other sheep that we are breeding from are fine. Yeah. Um, now we also uh, have just changed to six monthly shearing and that is sort of more for lamb survivability in our country. Um, what we found when we were shearing every eight months, um, because we've always sort of been breeding for clean fleece weight, um, but what we found every eight months was we would have one lambing in that two year cycle where we had so much mismothering because it just fell at the wrong time. So we uh, felt that we couldn't go back to 12 monthly shearing, so we decided to take the next step and, um, and look at six monthly shearing, which adds an extra cost, but we don't crutch generally. Um, so, you know, you take, you take out that. Now this year, uh, we've never had the country or the paddocks before to separate twins and singles. Um, but this year we have, uh, we've leased another little um, paddock uh, near Warrendale and uh, we separated twins and singles this year and the singles are fine. They, there's enough ground cover out there for them, for them to have their lambs, raise their lambs. But with the twins that we decided to set up um, feeders this year, um, pastoral panels uh, over at Arimple. Um, so have these massive three tonne feeders. So for us it was about making sure that the ewes had feeders and, bar and we only feed barley, we only supp supplement with barley. Um, we, it was minimal disturbance of the, of the ewes, so we wanted to be able to fill the feeders and just let them go and not worry too much about um, having to disturb them all the time while they're trying to lamb down the mismothering that goes with it um, and all those, um, all those sorts of things. It, it, and it's a trial and error. I'm not, I don't know what the result's going to be. I don't know if the decision we made to do that is going to be the correct one this year, but it's worth, it's worth a try. So, and, and the whole process I've found of sheep farming, because I'm actually not from... I'm not from the land, I was not born into it, I married, I married into it, um, but, um, and was a very, very happy farmer's wife for a long time, um, you know, raising kids, making sponges, <laughs> sewing, doing all that sort of thing, and then in 2000 Ian decided that uh, the Toyota dealership looked pretty good. And I said to him, who's going to run the farm? And he said, you can. I sort of went, oh, okay. Uh, so I went and learnt to wool class and found absolutely loved wool. Uh, taught wool classing for about 10 years at TAFE. Um, and I've got a very uh, inquisitive mind. So every time something comes up, I'm interested in it. I'll go and learn about it, but then I'll only take the snippets out of it that suit, that suit us. Uh, we also fleece weigh um, and we record everything, you know, 
everything that we can record about our sheep, we do, and we treat our sheep on an individual basis. And anything that's twice dry is gone. Uh, and the passengers are always a challenge, but um, maintaining stock numbers is, our, is where we're sort of trying to sit at because we put so much into genetics that for us to destock would be years of uh, research and years of um, breeding and then we've got to try and come back up again. So what I'm going to talk to you today is flock profiles, which is what we, uh, which is genomic flock profiles, um, which we've been involved in since 2016. Um, and uh, the one on the left, it was done with a pilot program. And uh, we were some of the producers that came into it. And we wanted to see where we sat um, in regard to the rest of the industry. So as you can see, um, clean fleece weight, as wool producers, clean fleece weight or fleece weight is one of our profit drivers. Even in a year like this, like with the wool prices that we've had over the last year or two, um, it's still very beneficial to our business to have good wool. But we also recognised that we really needed to concentrate on eye muscle, and that is for the U to have um, a better fuel tank, basically. Uh, more resources to draw down on uh, in tougher times so that we have to supplementary feed less. Uh, because supplementary feeding is a massive cost to any business. But uh, fat depth was also, maternal fat depth was also another trait that we were really interested in. Um, and someone please correct me who's got a scientific mind if I'm incorrect on this one. But um, the maternal fat depth um, creates the brown, the, vis the brown fat, the visceral fat around their organs. So that if a lamb does have um, a difficult birth or is a little slower to get up after mum takes off, then it has a few resources to draw down on until it's capable of getting up and moving after mum. So we selected three specific traits because, I mean, you can try and select for every trait you want, but the hardest thing about that is you're actually going to get nowhere. So um, we decided to focus on yielding clean fleece weight, yielding eye muscle depth, uh, for the reasons that I just spoke about, and yielding fat. And inadvertently, that created, that lifted um, our dual purpose index, because even though we are primarily wool growers, we need to be able to sell our sheep, our young weathers, we need to be able to sell them uh, for their carcass traits. So trying to put carcass traits into um, wool sheep without detracting from their wool, uh, we found that this method is, is how we use it. So we'll actually be doing a flock profile again. So as you can see in the two flock profiles that we've done, 2016, we sat um, at about 25% for clean fleece weight indexed um, across the sheep in Australia. Um, because our selection criteria was clean fleece weight, we've now moved to 20%. Um, yielding fat. Uh, we were pretty light on for yielding fat in uh, the 2016, but we're actually getting better with our yielding, f uh, our yielding fat on, um, in the 2018. As you can see, the dual purpose index, we're actually in the top 15% for dual purpose index now. So um, how we select our rams. <clears throat> so using um, the flock profiles, that um, the latest flock profile, as a benchmark when we go to do our ram selection, and, and this is the six rams that we purchased from East Loddon Merinos at the 2020 ram sale. Um, so all the green squares are the top 20% and all the blue squares are the top 10%. So for us, um, uh, Tom and Marcus send us a spreadsheet rather than just get the catalogue and put it all in ourselves, which is quite laborious. Um, they send me a spreadsheet and I then go through and put in our flock profile. 
At the moment, for yearling, um, for yearling weight, we are at 4.9. The industry average is 4.6, so we're slightly tracking above that. Yearling eye muscle depth, uh, we're 0.3. The industry average is 0.4, so we actually need to build up on that a little bit more. Um, yearling fat, um, Warrendale sits on zero, and uh, the industry average is 0.1. Uh, yearling clean fleece weight, we currently sit on 16.3 and the industry average is 14.1. And uh, yearling staple length uh, is 4.8, we set at, and the industry average is 6.3. Now, as you can see in amongst all those coloured squares up there, there's this one little pinky coloured square. And um, that was my mistake. Like I've said, never are we buying a ram that is under what Warrendale sits at, but I got a little bit um, <laughs> caught up <laughs> in the auction system, as you quite often do. And um, I bought this ram, who was 11.8, and we currently sit at 16.3. But it was a good mistake, because his yearling staple length um, sits in the top 10%. His um, yearling fat sits in the top 20%. His uh, yearling eye muscle depth sat in the top 10, and his weight and his post-weaning weight all sat uh, in the top 20%. So in hindsight, it was actually quite a good mistake, but it was still a mistake. So as commercial breeders, we're very happy to sit where we sit in the top 20% for clean fleece weight. Uh, the reason is we run the risk of, if we focus too much on clean fleece weight, we run the risk of genetic neg negative correlation with carcass traits. Um, so we're very mindful of the fact that we still need a good wool. On our sheep, we need more body, we need more eye muscle, but we still need a good fleece that sits on that sheep. So as eye muscle and fat are very important to us, we select rams with the traits that align with our breeding objectives. Um, and you've sort of got to be a bit clear on your breeding objectives on what you want to achieve so that you know where you're going to go and what, what you're going to buy. So in um, 2020, apart from eye muscle, fat and wool sitting where it all sits, we've chosen staple length and we've chosen yearling weight in our selection criteria. So this is our Ram Select team. So every year uh, when we buy rams, we go into Ram Select and we put in the ram team that we've just purchased. So, um, so the graph on the left shows where they're in red, it shows with the industry average, and in um, purple, it shows where our team sits, but it also shows the distribution. The blue is the distribution of, of um, our team. So, you know, like it's sort of an average is really good, some are better than others, and some need improving. But what I've noticed is that the positive outcome of selection for fat and muscle is an increase in, um, in the number of lambs weaned, and we've seen that on farm um, over the last couple of years. But inadvertently, we have um, de a decrease in breech wrinkle. Uh, so for us as a non-mules enterprise, decreasing our breech wrinkle is, you know, very important, but again, as I said before, what I noticed this year was DAG score had more of an impact as far as flies went, rather than um, rather than necessarily the wrinkle. I think for the shearers' sake, they would prefer less wrinkle, and for our own sake, we would prefer. But it takes seven to ten years to get it right, um, and we're, we're getting there. But uh, it's a journey, and we make mistakes along the way. But if you don't learn from your mistakes, work out what you did right and what you did wrong, then, then how do you know where to progress from there? And it's about looking forward, and it's about progressing. Um, but we've done all this without penalising our clean fleece weight, which is so important to us as wool growers. Um, as I said, I really like to participate in a lot, and uh, these are the on-farm projects. Um, the top right-hand side is blowfly collection for Trent, and much to Ian's disgust, um, that's our dining room table, <laughs> with blowflies all over it. But it was the first year, and we had to select only the green blowflies, and we had to put them into pipettes. So I think I sent you 100 pipettes in total, so that was, that was my nightly. 
um, routine was sitting there with uh, newspaper blowflies and, and um, watching television at the same time. Uh, we also have been, uh, we've also participated in um, three of Sally's projects, um, which are sand hill restoration projects and revegetation projects. So for us as a family business, um, it's about sustainability economically but also environmentally. Uh, because you know, we've got six children and we want to pass on our businesses to our six children for longevity. So for us, we, uh, I like to participate in all those things. And this is Sally <laughs> in uh, crow's foot up past her knees. Uh, we haven't seen that for a little while, have we, Sal? Um, but these are the Sand Hill restorations. And as you can see, I know it's not a very good picture, but the one on the very far left that shows the sand hill, part of the sand hill that we actually didn't restore, didn't fence off as compared to the other side, which has just got vegetation all through it. And this is the beautiful colours of native seeds that we um, so did a direct sow into uh, two of our sand hill restorations. So we, we sort of identified that sand hills were a real issue in the drought and Part of the reason why we diversified off-farm is because we're in our second drought in 20 years. Um, and so it's about sustainability. And that was, that was one of the things. One of the best things that we've ever done out there is the Gunbar water piping scheme. So these are all the tanks um, and all the poly pipe. And these are our... Um, uh, we put it in ourselves, so we were, we were very lucky to be part of um, the Murrumbidgee Irrigation uh, Water Efficiencies Program and the, the War War Stock and Domestic Scheme used to get water twice a year that came out from Griffith, which is over 150 kilometres away, um, and they used to fill our dams twice a year. Well, the amount of stock losses that we would get from the channels drying up in clay country, sheep would go in, you'd be checking them every day, so the added cost and labour of doing of checking the sheep um, when this came along um, and, and the whole idea of the scheme was water savings. So in the first 20 years, um, sorry, in the first two years um, of the project, um, the whole project has saved 20,000 megalitres in water. So our, our S&D allocation on farm is 28 megs. We use 2.6 of those uh, per year. So on farm, you know, we've saved at least 25 megs a year. But over the whole, over the whole 300,000 hectares which are involved in this, um, we've saved 20,000 megalitres so far, which is a huge saving. And 9,000 megalitres went back to the Snowy, um, as who, which funded this project. Um, I am one of the core producers in Laura's um, preg scanning, in Laura and Sue's preg scanning in the in extensive sheep flocks. And uh, we've also just completed on farm a lamb survivability honours project with um, our eldest daughter, uh, Ellie Quinn, who teaches at Yanko Ag and runs their White Suffolk stud. Without Ellie and Annabelle's input into the technical side of EID and ASBVs, um, I knew what I wanted to do but I didn't necessarily have the knowledge. Um, so they've been absolutely fantastic in getting an old person like me across the line as far as uh, technology goes. Okay, <laughs> right. Again, as Sally said before, we're extremely busy and I love being busy. Um, otherwise I probably wouldn't have had six children. <laughs> but uh, these are our, these are the roles that we currently play in the area. So we're been, I've been involved with the Pep and Shaw Youth Flock Forum for quite a number of years. Um, so I'm a committee member there. Uh, the Hay Marino Sheep Show, I sit on the committee and I'm, a flock, and I'm the flock steward. Hay Marino Sheep Show, Ian, my husband, is the convener. Hey Marino Breeders Incorporated, I'm the current secretary. I'm a member of Landcare. I taught wool classing for about 10 years at TAFE. 
love wool. I'm extremely passionate about wool. Uh, I sit on Wool Producers Australia board as an independent uh, director. I also now sit on uh, community, Bendigo Community Bank board um, as a director. I'm a director on uh, the Gumba Private Water Supply Board. I was so privileged to have received the AWI sponsorship to participate in Australian Rural Leadership. Um, and Wool Producers Australia, um, myself and Pete McCrabb and a couple of others, we were all lucky enough to get a sponsorship to do Australian Institute of Company Directors. And their skills that ordinarily wouldn't have been able to um, get, but it certainly gives them a whole different perspective on how we do it. So I guess my little bit of information here is take your opportunities when they present themselves um, and follow your passions, no matter what you do, um, whatever you're passionate about, and enthusiasm, um, enthusiasm breeds enthusiasm. So in whatever role you're going to go into as um, whether you lock your livestock advisors or research or whatever, just be enthusiastic about what you do because people will take that on board and become really enthusiastic as well. So uh, there's a couple of things that I'm going to speak to you about today. So that's basically what Lugston Farming is all about. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm being given the permission by, by Dr. John, um, and if I get his name wrong, is it Broster? Broster, thanks, Laura. And Dr. Susan, Susan Robertson. Um, as I said, we did uh, Ellie's Honours Project. Um, she's doing it through CSU. Um, and it's, it's a standalone honours research project with the uh, School of Animal and Veterinary Sciences at Charles Sturt University in Wagga. Um, and it's on lamb survivability in twin bearing ewes with maternal behaviour scores. So we had three weeks of fun. <laughs> so the objectives of Ellie's research um, looked into the perinatal uh, mortality um, causes and they usually occur in the first 72, 72 hours of, uh, of life. So starvation, mismothering and is a le leading, leading cause of mortality. So poor maternal behaviour score is one cause of starvation, mismothering, particularly in merinos. And this was done, I think this is the first time it's actually been done on merino to merino sheep. Um, and um, maternal behaviour scores, she uses the Sheep Genetics Australia maternal behaviour scores of one, two, three, four, five. One being uh, the ewe stands right next to you while you're touching her lambs. And five is when she's halfway across the paddock, not even looking backwards. So, um, so yeah, maternal behaviour scores is linked to survival, but it's linked to continued contact with newborn lambs. So what... Um, what we did was um, data loggers. So as you can see, this is, um, this is a maternal score one new. She sat right next to her lambs the whole time that the data loggers were put on the lambs. Now the lambs had to be a certain weight before a data logger, so for animal ethics issues, had to be a certain weight before data loggers were allowed to be put on. So if the lamb was under two kilos at birth, and these were all twin bearing ewes, and when we scanned um, to select these ewes, they were all fetal, fetal aged as well. So they were all to lamb down at approximately the same time, within about a week or two of each other, and uh, they all had to be twin bearing. So, um, so we, we chose 20, 25 in total, but we only put collars or loggers on 16 of them. Um, and they were proximity loggers, so it's about how often that particular lamb comes up and interacts with that ewe. So we were able to, so at birth, all the ewes beforehand uh, were all condition scored, so they're all over condition score three, but they were put on um, feeders. Uh, there was a feeder in the paddock. There was a lot of vegetation in the paddock, but they were also allowed to feed um, at, at their will. So they could go and have a feed whenever they wanted to. 
But um, the ewes were all fitted with proximity loggers and then as the lambs were born, they were all, their ear tag was recorded, um, they were all weighed, and I'll get to the next picture. Um, but after three days of the last lamb arriving, the, um, the proximity loggers were actually removed. So uh, this is U12 looking very pregnant and she's got her data logger on. And then the lambs had, as I said, they had to be over two kilos. If they were under two kilos, and, and sometimes there was a twin born under two kilos, then, those, then that particular lamb was not allowed to, be, um, to have the logger on. It was just too heavy for it. Um, and they were each numbered, so, uh, so that, that we could match all the numbers up. But these were the lamb proximity collars over here, and these are the ewes. And this is Ellie weighing the lambs. So uh, the lambs were weighed, um, they were ear tagged, and the maternal behaviour score was recorded. Um, and, and yes, so it, it was a really interesting, very, very interesting project. And she will actually be doing another one on a stud. Um, so we did it on basically rangeland co uh, commercial sheep. Um, the ewes, would, uh, they're from Warrendale. They were just brought in to Birua, um, which is our property on the river. And um, the reason for that was because of the extensiveness of the area, it was just way too hard to try and go out every day, twice a day, to find the ewe that's lambed and do all the data recording. Um, so yes. Now my other role, um, which is what I'll talk to you about now, is Wool Producers Australia. So I currently sit on the board. Uh, I'm an independent. Um, I'm an independent director. Um, I'm not sort of. Composition of the board is made up of six state farmer organisation representatives, three democratically elected independent directors, which I'm one of, and uh, one independent chair. So my role with wool producers, um, and again, I like to be busy. Um, I sit on the Health and Welfare Subcommittee of Wool Producers Australia, and that's in conjunction with Animal Health Australia. Um, I also sit on the uh, NFF Trade Committee as a Wool Producers representative, uh, together with Adam Dawes, who is our General Manager. Um, I sit on the uh, Wool Production Forecasting Committee with um, Sue Hatcher. Uh, I, I'm currently on the AWEX Code of Practice Review, um, for the current code of practice that's coming out, and I also sit on the Finance and Audit Committee. So, um, AW, um, AWI, sorry, sorry, Jeff. Um, Australia, wool Producers Australia is a, is a peak industry body that represents wool growers. We work in conjunction with Animal Health Australia and they fund a lot of our um, projects. Um, We've just recently uh, completed Exercise Argonaut, which is uh, emergency animal diseases and what happens if it gets into Australia. Um, policy research, we are basically an advocacy board. Uh, we advocate on behalf of wool, of wool producers. And this is basically what, what wool producers is and how it's made up and we've recently um, so we've made up Western Australian farmers, as I said, they're the six state farmer organisations down the bottom. Uh, those six uh, state farmer organisations also sit on the Health and Welfare Committee, but um, you've got Australian Wool Growers Association, Australian Superfine Growers, uh, and um, the sheep, camelid and goat veterinarians all sit on, on that particular um, committee as well. So Wool Producers is a... Um, a member of National Farmers Federation. We also collaborate with Animal Health Australia, Safe Meat, AWEX, Integrity Systems, Australian Wool Testing Authority, MLA, AWI, um, and then we're also answerable and collaborate with uh, to Parliament of Australia, uh, the Australian Government, um, so Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment, and also uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Okay, what have I done? <laughs> oh, I hit the wrong button. Yes, of course I did. <laughs> so on the 18th of March, um, wool producers launched Trust in Australian Wool. 
in, in conjunction with uh, Animal Health Australia. Um, it was an online forum. There were over 300 people or 300 registered um, participants in that particular thing. And the reason why Trust in Australian Wool was launched was because um, social media is so big, like animal, uh, how do I put this without being mean? Um, our Australia's reputation for health and welfare can be perceived by um, organisations such as Four Paws and, and Peter or Petter or whoever you want to call them um, about, and it's all on musing, uh, but it doesn't, it, the whole focus is on how bad musing is. But musing is the you know, lesser of two evils. Um, so it's about showing the world through social media, and social media can be quite misleading and, and false when it comes to how good animal, um, Australia's ethics and animal welfare is. So this particular program was launched and it was aimed at a lot of the overseas buyers because there are certain buyers that will not touch Australian wool if it's not mules and, and the social licence that we were talking about before. Um, and it's about putting our story across, our story as to how good Australia is at looking after their animals. So yeah, there are some things that we do that aren't always the best, but it's usually the lesser of two evils. You've got to look at it from that perspective. So we're just trying to get the whole thing across as to where Australia has very high welfare and ethical standards. No one deliberately goes out to herd a sheep that day, but that, well, that's the way it's perceived at times. Um, so, so Trust in Australian Wool was launched on the 18th. Um, and we had a fantastic roll-up, um, but it's, and also the sheep sustainability framework has only just recently come out. And um, that was um, board members from Wool Producers Australia and Sheep Producers Australia actually sat on the sheep sustainability uh, board. And the priority for sheep sustainability is animal care, economic resilience, climate and natural resources and community. So it takes in a whole array of things. Um, and then this just shows um, trust in Australian wool is about Australian wool and the trade, sheep health and welfare, biosecurity and traceability, which is so important, especially if there's an a emergency animal disease like foot and mouth or something like that, because no one, we won't be able to move our wool off farm. Um, if an outbreak comes, clip preparation. So it's about maintaining the standards through the code of practice of what clip preparation is about. Wool specification and marketing. So um, the National Wool Declaration is not mandatory, um, but it still is a document that shows traceability. So, uh, and it's all about sustainability. So for anyone who's uh, interested, um, there is a website um, www.trustinaustralianwool.com uh, or you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere like that. So thank you very much. Um, Thanks Stacey, that was fantastic. My mind is spinning. Um, quick question for Stacey before Jeff Linden um, from AWI has his presentation. Yep. Uh, g'day Stacey. Um, when you're talking about figures, mm -hmm. uh, do you think, so if we use the example of fleece weights and the same could be said about weaning weights, mm -hmm. uh, a fair part of that's environmental. Do you yes. think, uh, so, so river and a strong wool sheep might cut seven or eight kilos and have a weaner weight of 42 kgs. Uh, when you talk about industry averages, they're being compared with a, a fine wool from the tablelands that might cut three and a half kilos. Do you think uh, inexperienced younger producers more likely can be maybe fooled into a false sense of security of what they're selecting? Yes, I, I, look, I do agree with that. And as I said, I'm, um, I'm still learning about this, but this is um, the way that we've found, and we can see it in our flock, we're getting better carcass traits. 
Um, but, but you're right. Uh, I think every, ASBVs are still um, an unknown to a lot of people. Um, and what you've got to do is, it, it doesn't matter what their ASBV is, you can set them up genetically, right? The environment is always such a big issue. So genetically, you can give them the potential. But then it's up to you as a producer to bring that potential to the surface. Um, so so what, what I'm finding is that we're getting better carcass traits. Um, we're getting better fleece weights. Like we, because shearing was pushed forward late two weeks and forward two weeks, and we decided to switch to our six monthly shearing, we actually shore at five months. And that was um, not the best thing to do, but what we found was our fleece weights. We still cut three and a half kilos at five months and 55 mils. So we can see uh, in our flock that by choosing for those particular traits that we've made the improvements that we're after. But I do agree that um, it is a complete unknown because when you look at it, you think 16.3, what are they going to cut 16.3 kilos? No, they're not. It's where they sit on the index. But by, but the environment has such a massive issue and you're right, Southern Tablelands is compared with um, rangelands, but it's about your individual sheep. ASBVs are only a guide. So, and, and you never purchase a sheep based on ASBVs alone. You always go and look at them visually. So you look at their carcass traits, you look at their feet, you look at their staple, you look at their staple length, um, and, and you make the selection that you feel suits your enterprise. So is that, does that give you an answer? Okay. Okay, any more? No, we're all one down here. Just a quickie. Um, I understand that you want to maintain stock numbers throughout the year. Mm. Um, what did you do in the situation of drought? Like, what were your strategies? Spent a lot of money on feed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we select, because we put a lot of money into our genetics, um, for us, destocking is minimal. Um, so, what we try to do, we don't set up, we don't have a drought lot. Um, and we have a set sort of stocking paddocks, and um, I'm very interested in how some other producers uh, do rotational grazing in rangelands um, and things like that. So you, you're always learning, you're always evolving. But for us, we purchase, and when it was $400 a ton, that was challenging, but we've been able, when we came out of uh, the drought, we had full numbers. and and. We were condition scoring because we had our first non-mulesed audit with AWEX because we ticked the box and said we're non-mulesed. Uh, Jim Meckiff came out and went through our sheep to make sure that we weren't telling any porkies. Um, and some of, the, some of those sheep were in condition score four. But most of the ewes, and we um, condition scored them at, at um, scanning, most of those ewes were over condition score three. So the singles we were able to just leave alone and let them raise their lamb without disturbance, but we've decided to feed the twins uh, so that we don't, so that we have a better, hopefully, and as I said, I won't know this until we do it, so we'll have a better marking rate. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Stacey. That was very no informative. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we're on our last speaker.